we may live in different times, come from various backgrounds, maintain different values, and even speak different languages. But when it comes to demons, we all seem to agree that they are bad news. This video is not for children, and quite simply, what I will unveil here is harrowing. Our traditions, culture, our church molds the concept of what a demon is, and scholars have noted that ancient Near Eastern texts from Sumer, Akkad, Babylonia, Elam, Ugarit, Byblos, Canaan, all over the ancient world. <clears throat> it's about the race of Gidom and Babylonia. They were packed with references to these demons. The Bible is rife with demonic presence, and rabbinical as well as Christian traditions hold that demons are fallen angels, and there are many names for this species of nefarious spirits. But in this video, we are approaching the topic of demons from a very different perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me. We abandon the religious, the occult and mystical, and we will focus on what the demonic entity is within the context of simulation theory. This video is credited to my friend Jen. Lately, I have been conducting calls, Zooms, like interviews, Skypes, uh, just general discourses with people wanting to consult on a variety of matters, on office predictions, on isometric analysis, uh, employing my, my date sequence analytics uh, on current events for different countries. And I've been doing this to fund the Archaics research with the idea in mind of working further on my Chronicon project. But for now, this is the origin of demons. So we're on the same page so that you and I are talking about the exact same thing. I will relate something. I've, I mentioned it in one video about a year ago. I'm going to tell you the full story right now. I do have one incident in my life where I came in contact, or very close contact, with a demonic entity. No doubt in my mind. And this is from someone who doesn't even, I don't, I'm not, I don't subscribe to the paranormal, the mystical. You know my videos are very straightforward. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, none of that stuff. I just don't really entertain it. So, I'm going to tell you now that uh, <clears throat> there's really no plausible explanation for what I saw outside the context of a demon. For what I smelled, for what I heard, uh, in 1996, at the Maximum Security Prison in Livingston, Texas, I sat in the day room at a metal table with two other guys. We were surrounded by other prisoners. This is what we did every single day. Suddenly, we heard a ruckus, screaming and banging as bodies in a fight. You have to understand, it's, just, it's, something, we, it's something that we almost ignored because it happens all the time. You hear bodies hit walls, bunks, lockers, desk, door, toilet. It's a closed environment, a cell where two guys fighting. They're going to touch everything in that cell. So it was this, this confrontation was going on on three row above us. And fights between cellmates was common. And we listened and realized the noise was coming from Michael Mott's cell. He was a buddy of mine. I hope he's not offended. I don't even know if he's alive today. But his real name is Michael Mott. And if you're out there, Mike, you can definitely send me an email to the bottom of this video. Anyway, all three of us, we ran up the stairs as the screeching and the banging continued. And the first thing that happened to me as I arrived at his, cl at his closed cell door was this heavy coldness, this putrid, rotten egg smell, and my hair stood on end. And inside the cell, it was all dark. And this is very unusual. You have to understand... It's, it's, it was like a thick smoke that was in there from a fire. The cell was, was dark. It's difficult to see in there. But the bright fluorescent lighting in the cell was working just fine. You, I, I, I could see. The whole ceiling was lit up. So, uh, <clears throat> very unusual. An officer in the control picket saw something was up. And he, and, and he pressed the button. And Michael Mott's cell door opened. And, and Mike, 
He came out screaming, looking wild, sprinted down the stairs. I almost followed him, but I couldn't move. I stared into Mike's cell to see this thick, dark, this just, I don't, I want to say fog, but it wasn't. Uh, <clears throat> all his property was tore up. There was no sign of his cellmate. He had been in that cell alone. There's no way all that noise we heard was one person. So, so we went downstairs, and I saw Mike's body. He was bleeding, but it wasn't fists. We fight with fists, sometimes with knives. Yeah, it's, I mean, it happens. Uh, I've used one before. I got in a lot of trouble for it. Now, uh, he had, I hate even saying this, because I don't want to undermine everything I've ever, ever done, but I have to tell the truth. He had claw marks on his body, and it was very, very unusual. Uh, I didn't know how to process this at the time. But he had whole scratches like he had fought a tiger. And he was spooked. And that was what really unnerved me, how spooked he was. And we listened to him, and he told us that he was designing a Dungeons & Dragons character from some gaming books, and how he must have dozed off as he was imagining what powers to choose for his, his character, who was a wizard. And when suddenly... He woke up. He realized he wasn't in the cell alone. A shadow jumped on him, and they fought. And uh, nothing about Michael Mott's story could I, I believe was untrue because I was there. I heard the screeching. I heard the fighting. I smelled the rot. I felt the cold in the summer, like early summer, late late spring, but it was warm that day. Uh, I saw how dark his cell looked. I thought the fluorescent lights uh, might, might not have been working, but I remember looking at him and, and seeing that, man, they're bright, just like everybody else's. Um, I remember one of the guys at the table, he, he had gone back up there and it was like a totally different cell. It was all messed up. There was blood, Michael Mott's blood on, on different things, but that darkness, that haze was gone. A cell looked totally normal. It wasn't even cold on three row anymore. And that was just, I remember how unusual that was too. So, um, <clears throat> All his wounds and his fear was real. So real, in fact, that Michael was baptized within weeks. He became the chapel assistant. He converted to Christianity almost immediately. I saw Mott years later at another prison. He was still a Christian. I never forgot that story. We were, we were still buddies. We just kind of just fell apart. I was a Christian at the time. But uh, <clears throat> it's very. it was just a really weird experience. But this is my only experience in, in my 48 years of life with a demon that I know of. But unlike Michael Mott, I do not carry the religious baggage that lends to interpretation as to what demons are. And, excuse me, <clears throat> late night coffee's killing me. I don't know why I drink it at night. I'm addicted to coffee. It's a good thing to be addicted to coffee and not anything else. So, but my own belief about demons, it must comport to my paradigm. I am a simulationist. A byproduct of my research, it's this recognition that we have been technologically advanced before. And this video cannot itemize here the evidence for this. I have myriads of videos and posts showing all this. I'm not doing it here. In this chain of evidence is a chronological construct from the ancient past until today where my own contemporaries are designing simulations for all sorts of experiments, including marketing them for the gaming industry. A virtual reality type simulation is already invented in our time. And already in our time, transhumanists are attempting to bridge human consciousness with computer programming. Therefore, as I have told you guys before, my analysis of anything in the particular must also encompass the whole. If we take a scientific approach and compartmentalize our evidence, our conclusions will they'll be restricted to the particulars. When considering the evidence of demons in my own personal experience, that one time in my life on a maximum security cell block, and the thousands of references to demons in ancient texts and hundreds of theories in the religious writings of the past, I must interpret these things through the filters of my paradigm. Simulation theory. The truth about demons is that they are intelligences just, just like we are, but with a fundamental difference. We are jacked into the simulacrum via the central nervous system, and therefore we are restricted in many ways. Demons are intelligences that are not moored to the simulacrum and are free from the electromagnetic mooring to an avatar. They cannot temporarily take possession of an avatar. Well, they can often temporarily take uh, possession of an avatar, but they can never oust the host, the personality within. 
they can only temporarily overcome it. The church fulfills a role that does the exact opposite of what people of faith believe. The church is the actual vehicle by which these demonic intelligences gain and hold their power. Without the church's insistence that we fear and watch out for these demonic beings, no awareness of these beings would exist. Without a human awareness, there is no energy output. Without focused energy output, there is no informed field created. Without an informed field, there is no way an intelligence without an avatar can operate within the simulacrum. It's that simple. Some personalities are sent into the simulacrum to perform a certain act, and they either fail or consciously decide not to do what it was they were sent to perform. Either way, they are denied a proper exit. These individuals on the other side, outside our simulacrum, have bodies of their own lying dormant as their minds are jacked into the cerebral interface holography. When operating through an avatar in this dreamscape we call reality, the exit is performed when the avatar loses its informed field, which to us is death by old age, murder, accident, execution, disease. By these methods, the personality is detached from the avatar without harm. Death is not negative. It's a gate. And you, and you, we leave the we leave the simulacrum and go back to where we naturally are and remember everything. Demons, from the perspective of we humans, intelligences trapped in avatars of perceived physicality, demons are terrible, evil, malicious, wicked, hateful. But this is only half true. Outside the simulacrum, when a participant has not fulfilled their goal or disobeyed the directive for which they entered the simulacrum, or some other unknown cause, and has their cerebral interface prematurely disconnected without going through the proper separation protocols, this personality is torn from their real body outside the simulacrum, and, and imprisoned within the simulacrum's holography, but as an incorporeal intelligence without the benefit of an avatar. They no longer have a physical body to control while being here. <clears throat> Imagine a scenario where there are hundreds of simulation wards where people are lying dormant in vast observatories. Right now, you, me, we, we all have real bodies jacked into the network. I am telling you this from inside the simulacrum, but on the outside, our bodies are under observation by other humans because these lifetimes we are living, they're only minutes, maybe hours. And there are underlying themes in, these, in this historical programming routines that we discover that infer that there was a war, a conflict, and the victors went through the wards and unplugged everyone belonging to the opposing political party. Their bodies lying in the observatories as their minds were living out life sins inside the simulacrum would die or remain on life support. Their personalities, the very fabric of their spirits, would find themselves trapped inside the simulacrum. Now when they died in this false reality, it would only be a departure of their avatar because their personality, which is a bioresonant field, would remain here, unplugged unable to escape the simulacrum because the unplugging on the other side stopped the necessary separation from avatar protocols. As soon as the soul personality is freed from the present avatar, it then remembers its true identity outside the simulacrum and also understands what has happened. A glitch, a programming failure, a murder. Their defenseless body was attacked and their cerebral interface units were shut down, trapping them here until the total collapse of the simulacrum. You can imagine the desperation, the fear, then the anger, then the pure hatred a soul would experience if they suddenly found themselves cut off from both home and, and of having a physical avatar to enjoy while here. The total separation from the human family, both outside and inside the simulacrum. 
lost souls trapped between two worlds, one artificial and the other real and no longer approachable. Can you imagine that? Many of these lost souls wander and are known as ghosts, specters, shades, phantoms. But they grow more fearful and more angry, and some even create informed fields and actually become poltergeists, able to manifest phenomena inside the simulacrum. Those that retain their faith that one day they'll be set free either disappear as the simulacrum uh, edits, edits for them escapes or returns, or edits them out of the holography altogether. But the others, they become hateful. And this pure ire becomes a force, an informed field able to manifest as physical phenomena. These are demons. And these demons have been with us at least since the beginning of recorded history. No matter what simulation, fractured timeline, reset or reinitiated chronology we are living out, these demons have always been with us. And there is a very peculiar fact attached to the ancient stories of demons. A story that denotes that on the outside of the simulacrum, they were taught something very special about Egypt and what lies there. For we have traditions and texts claiming that when demons are exorcised from people, they always flee straight to Egypt. My viewers know what's in Egypt. I have a whole playlist about that ancient structure at Giza. And you know... I often speak of the return of the chief cornerstone, the stone the builders rejected. One of his avatars was Jesus, and during his life here, he had mercy on the demons. You know the story when he allowed them to pass into the pigs. Demons torn away from their bodies to suffer endless wandering in this series of simulations. Falsely accused of being all kinds of nefarious things until they become those things. It gives a whole new meaning to fallen angels and to the prophetic statement, He came to set the captives free. I'm Jason of Archaics. My email is below, and the more presentations I provide, the more I can use your donations. In both the description box and the comment section below, you will find my personal email. Ask me any questions. If you have video ideas, I'd like to hear them. And if you want to donate, all those buttons are accessible below. Playlists and everything you might need. Access to the gates to, the, to my websites.